Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're continuing through the book of Isaiah, and here we're going to see Isaiah address Babylon. Now, he's speaking in the most immediate context to, of course, the nation of Babylon, who overtook uh, the people of Judah, leading them to a period of exile for about 70 years, as the prophet Jeremiah framed it, uh, followed by their deliverance from Persia, which was founded by God's, he's actually called the anointed King Cyrus. We're going to see more from Cyrus and his descendants, Darius and Xerxes, in our upcoming study in the book of Esther. But God's not done with Babylon. And the name Babylon, if you've studied the book of Revelation, sounds familiar. And there's some confusion as to what Babylon is. Babylon in the book of Revelation is basically just like the whole worldliness of lost culture writ large. And it's represented by this seeming like resurrected version of this ancient Babylon known for its idolatry and for its depravity. Let's look at God's word to Babylon in Isaiah chapter 47. Go down and sit in the dust, virgin daughter Babylon. All right, Babylon here is referred to as a virgin because Babylon was utterly undefeated. Right, uh, was you know was was pretty much uh, was, was had never been enslaved, had never been conquered, and so watch the imagery change as the prophecy unfolds. Sit on the ground without a throne, daughter Chaldea. Right, these were uh, the these Chaldeans uh, were the Aramaic speaking uh, Babylonians from the southern marsh regions who in the Neo-Babylonian uh, period from 626 to 586 BC would end up taking over the whole thing. For you will no longer be called pampered and spoiled. It was good to be a Babylonian until all of this prophecy is about to come true. Take millstones and grind flour, remove your veil, strip off your skirt, bear your thigh, wade through the streams. So this is, this is denoting uh, Babylon as a privileged woman of royalty who was pampered, like the previous verse says, but now, because of what's about to happen to them, uh, it's going to be like a woman who was known, uh, who had only known uh, opulent luxury her entire life, but now has to wade across the river uh, and, and perform the work of a slave. Your nakedness will be uncovered and your disgrace will be exposed. I will take vengeance. I will spare no one. The Holy One of Israel is our Redeemer. The Lord of armies is His name. Daughter Chaldea, sit in silence and go into darkness, for you, know, you will no longer be called Mistress of Kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my possession, and I handed them over to you. You showed them no mercy. You made your yoke very heavy on the elderly. So the Babylonians were used of God to discipline his own people. However, the way that they treated the people of Judah during that period of exile uh, would warrant harsh discipline or perhaps wrath from God. So he was angry with his people and he profaned his own possession and he handed them over to the Babylonians. But while the Babylonians were, were conquering the people of God, they, sh they showed zero mercy. And this is, a, this is something that's, that's uh, Bible-wide. If you show no mercy, you will not receive mercy. Verse 7, you said, I will be the queen forever. You do not take these things to heart or think about their outcome. Wow. This is a prophecy to ancient Babylon, but it could be said to any oppressive system of thought or governmental body that oppresses the people of God and thinks of itself as indomitable, right? When you hear the line, be on the right side of history, this is a common, this is a common phrase, and it really, uh, really amounts to chronological snobbery. It's a logical fallacy. When, uh, when we want to be on the right side of history, I find that it's best to actually be on God's side of history, and God is the author of history, so that seems like a winning proposition to me, all right? I'd, I know that my children will not be ashamed of me. As long as they walk with the Lord, they will not be ashamed of the fact that their father stood by the word of God, all right? So when, when you are intimidated and outnumbered, be bold, 
and stand by the word of the Lord, because every system of thought that has ever oppressed the word of God, going back thousands of years, has always fallen, and the word of God remains today. Where are the Babylonians today? They're nowhere to be found. The ashes of their empire have long since scattered, but we are currently reading from the word of God. They said, I will be queen forever. That's what Babylonians thought. To think that your nation is indomitable is a fallacy. The Babylonians thought it. Uh, ancient Greece proper thought it. The Roman Empire thought it. The Persian Empire thought it. The Ottoman Empire thought it. Like every every ancient empire um, really that ultimately would defy God. I know the Roman Empire is a bit of an exception to that, but they ultimately would fall. So now hear this lover of luxury who sits securely, who says to herself, I am and there is no one else. I will never be a widow or know the loss of children. Now, this is a fallacious line of thinking that some Christians are actually uh, susceptible to as well. This is, this is something that Babylon thought of herself, and there are Christians and Christian teachers that seem to suggest this. This is actually the number one reason that people give when they leave their Christian faith behind. Uh, according to 1 John, they're going out from us, shows that they were never really among us. They are much like the type of soil in Jesus' parable of the sower that seems to bear fruit at first, but as soon as the sun comes out, as soon as they face difficulty, as soon as they face persecution, uh, they just wither, meaning that they never really were to begin with. Now, what this is articulating is the thought, the vain, deluded thought that was pervasive throughout Babylon thinking, uh, I, I'm it, there's no one else, I will never be a widow or know the loss of children. Uh, in fact, Babylon would lose children by their own hands. Uh, Darius would implement a practice that was absolutely brutal, wherein uh, the men of a family would choose one woman and then they would strangle every other woman in their family. Um, it was absolutely, absolutely brutal. Excuse me, that was, that was uh, Darius was Persian. Uh, they would lose, um, they, they would lose you know, obviously you have widows, you're losing men, and then the loss of children. These two things will happen to you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. All right, I think this is prophesying that day that uh, they were conquered by the Persians and then Darius. Uh, same guy who, uh, the, the same guy who you know from the book of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den, um, that, was, that was King Darius. Uh, he's the one who forced the Babylonians to basically choose which woman in their family would live, and they also slaughtered a lot of the men, and it happened all in a day. They will happen to you in their entirety in spite of your many sorceries and the potency of your spells. So uh, within Babylonian culture, the occult uh, was was rampant, and this is, this is consistent with the conversation that we saw uh, between, um, this, this, this is uh, consistent with the conversations that you see between like Babylonian culture and the people of, of God and scripture. Uh, they were very polytheistic and they thought themselves to be gods. You were secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge led you astray. You said to yourself, I am, and there's no one else. All right. So this again, directed at the Babylonians, but can sometimes hit us as Christians in the New Testament era, also square on the nose, right? This idea, no one sees me, man, believe me, um, everything that you do in the dark is going to come to light at some point. Oof, and it's brutal. Your wisdom and knowledge led you astray, all right? This, is, uh, th this means that they, they thought they had wisdom, they thought that they had knowledge, um, but that's the that's the tricky thing. That's what what was it that Mark Mark Twain said? The things that you know that just aren't so. Like that's what really gets you. Uh, you said to yourself, "I am," and there's no one else. See this. Uh, this is sort of a this sort of echoes the self deification of Babylonian culture. But disaster will happen to you. You will not know how to avert it, and it will fall on you. But you will be unable to ward it off. Devastation will happen to you suddenly and unexpectedly. Now we start to see how God is speaking really explicitly to the enemies of God. And this is true of the enemies of God. It was true of ancient Babylon. It's true as well of the future Babylon described in the book of Revelation. So take your stand with your spells and your many sorceries. God's like, bring it on. Bring out your little toy wooden figurine which you have wearied yourself with from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to succeed. Perhaps you will inspire terror. All right, so here uh, Isaiah is talking smack, all right, as we call it. That's uh, maybe I'm a millennial, an older millennial, and maybe that dates me a little bit, but that's, 
That's what I think of in this. And we've seen this in other prophets as well. Their confidence in God is so high that they would actually mock uh, pagan worshipers and, and say that, and, and tell them, you know, to evoke their God. Think about Elijah at Mount Carmel uh, taunting the worshipers of Baal, saying, perhaps your God is busy. And the Hebrew word that's used, uh, that's translated busy, also connotates, you know, uh, restroom activity. And so he's, he's taunting the worshipers of Baal. Uh, in uh, Elijah was, and now Isaiah is uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, taunting the Babylonians. You are worn out with your many consultations. So let the astrologers stand and save you, those who observe the stars, those who predict monthly what will happen to you. Isn't this crazy? Because this actually, this is in the Seattle Times. This, this, is, this is still happening today. Uh, Isaiah is mocking the futility of it. Other Old Testament prophets would also mock the futility of this. Look, they are like stubble. Fire burns them. They cannot rescue themselves from the power of the flame. This is not a coal for warming themselves or a fire to sit beside. So he's being very clear. This is the fire of the wrath of God Almighty, and you cannot escape it. This is what they are to you, those who have wearied you and have traded with you from your youth. Each wanders on his own way. No one can save you. And so if you sell your soul to the pagan culture that presides over and subdues Christianity. I feel like, uh, I feel like any of our, our college students who are at public universities, especially uh, reading this, I want you to know, uh, man, you stand by the word of God. If you try to kowtow, if you give in, if you cower, if you bend the knee, and if you concede the gospel to the pagan teaching that presides over you, if you're in one of those settings, just know that they're all going to turn on you. And you will have forsaken God, and you will have forsaken, really, your classmates and your professors, because you will have denied the one true gospel, the one thing that saves. And every single one of those people will turn on you. All right? You've traded with them from your youth. You've done business with them your whole life. And now every one of them is going to wander on his way. No one can save you, because uh, you, Babylon, have just picked a fight with the Almighty God. Good luck with that. All right, I'll see you tomorrow as we continue through the book of Isaiah.